Part One. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully, and answer questions one to five. Hello. Hello. Who is this? Hello. I'm a representative of the Tally Ho Survey Company, and I'd like to ask you a few questions regarding exercise. Ah, that's an interesting subject. Yes, we think so too. But I'm afraid I'm a bit busy at the moment. Don't worry. This will only take about four minutes at the most. It's ten twenty-five now, so it will all be over by ten thirty. Well, all right. If it's that short, it will be. So one of the first things I need to know is where you are. That is, which suburb or area of the city. The last client was in Blackburn, for example. Blackburn, that's close to me. I'm in Box Hill. Another eastern suburb, then. I have a friend in Box Hill too. Interesting place. Now, I need your approximate age for this survey. Are you younger than twenty, between twenty and twenty-nine, thirty and thirty-nine, and so on? I'll turn forty in a few months, so that puts me in the forty to forty-nine age group. Well, that's in a few months. So right now you're in the thirty to thirty-nine. All、oh, right. So put that then. Okay. Now I need to know your occupation. The last caller was a housewife, for example. The one before that, a teacher. I used to be a teacher too, teaching cookery. And now? Now you can just put domestic duties. Actually, I hope to begin a new job soon as a cook, but that won't be for some time yet. I have to wait for my husband's restaurant to open. Cook, that sounds interesting, but it's domestic duties for now. Okay, that just leaves some information about your family. This is not obligatory at all, so if you don't want to answer, that's fine. What sort of information exactly? Oh, it's very broad. Married with children, single mother, that sort of thing. The last customer said she was a single mother. I'm married and not a mother. Put. Married, no children. I'm married with children myself, but I'll put in your details, and that finishes the profile and just leaves the actual survey itself. If you're ready to proceed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen. And answer questions six to ten. All right, let's begin the survey now about your exercise habits. I'm afraid I don't exercise much at all. Well, the main question is in what form you take your exercise, however little that may be. For example, in just cleaning, do you clean the house? My husband does the cleaning actually, but I walk to the supermarket and shops very often, up to four times a week. I'll put that then. Unless there's something else. Nothing else really, but I diet. I'm very strict about what I eat. Oh, and I do yoga, although that's not very energetic. More a form of relaxation and to tighten my muscles. They're both important, of course. But what about sport? Do you undertake any sporting activities? This could be very infrequent. In the past, for example. My husband plays basketball at the local school, and I sometimes watch. When he was younger, he was in a basketball team, but I never participated. Have you done anything at all? I used to hike in a nearby national park. Well, that's a definite physical activity, so I'll put that, but not basketball. All right, that just leaves future exercise intentions. Do you plan or expect to do at some stage any form of exercise? I once dreamt of doing modern dance, but that's never going to happen. Realistically, I'm thinking about going swimming at the local aquatic centre. Although my husband thinks we should just jog, I can't see myself doing that though. Too tiring. I can understand. I used to jog too, and it really makes you sweat. I'd say swimming's a much better option. But I'll be starting this job as a cook in my husband's restaurant. 
I imagine I'll be very tired doing all those late shifts. But if I have any energy left over, I might go to the aquatic center to release some stress. All right. Well, that's the end of the survey. Thank you very much for your time. Here ends the part one. You have now thirty seconds to review your answers to part one. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Thank you all for coming to our community meeting. As you know, we're excited to unveil our improvement plan as we look forward to the influx of tourists in the summer months. I'll start with a quick overview of the main points of interest in the area for anyone who may not quite know his or her way around yet, and then I'll get to the improvements made. First off is my favourite, the Science Museum, which is on the corner of St George Road. If you have not visited yet, I encourage you to go before the busy season. It is absolutely spectacular. There is even a flight simulator you can try out. Just west of the Science Museum is the National History Museum. It's a sight not to be missed as well, with each floor devoted to a different era in our nation's history. There are special exhibits for children with interactive games and fun history lessons too. If you're looking for parking, it is available on the intersection of Queen Street and South King Street in the car park. Standard hourly and daily rates do apply. The best place for souvenirs is the shopping mall, though it gets extremely busy during peak times. You can get there from the tube or the entrance on Timber Road. Just south of Cornwall Road, this area has students everywhere, usually from the primary school across the street from the shopping mall. Classes often take field trips and engage in guided tours through the area. So that's the overview of the main sites, and hopefully by now I've given you a general idea of the area. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now I'm going to outline the improvements we have made in our efforts to make the experience even better for each and every one of our visitors. You probably noticed when you first drove into the car park this morning that there is now additional signage to help avoid confusion. The directions were not entirely clear at first. So we have increased the number of one-way signs indicating the correct direction of traffic flow. Not far from there, in line with our mission of giving back to the community, we constructed a brand new playground for the primary school. It is really something to be excited for. The equipment is state of the art and includes swings, a small climbing wall, and even an obstacle course. Now we'll head north and take a look at the science museum. In response to our feedback from past visitors to the museum, there is now free information available 
outlining not only upcoming IMAX showings but also natural wonders like meteor showers, eclipses, and other cool natural events. The Science Museum isn't the only museum improving the experience of its visitors. The National History Museum has added an entire new wing to its facility to accommodate the large crowds of people gathering to see the Civil War exhibit, Inventions Timeline exhibit, and other wonderful sections of the museum. The increase in space will definitely give a more calm, comfortable experience for visitors. And finally, remember when there was actually a line at the mall entrance from the tube station? It was terrible trying to get anywhere from the tube because foot traffic got so backed up sometimes. We have addressed that by adding another entry point into the mall from the other end of the platform to disperse the crowd. So those are the major improvements we have made. Clearly, having too many people that want to visit and enjoy what our community has to offer the public is a good problem to have. And I am confident that we have made the changes necessary to accommodate the growing interest in the area. As always, we welcome any questions, comments, or concerns about the new improvement plan. In a few minutes, I will open up the floor for questions. But you can also contact me or any other board member by email or through the city website. Thank you for coming, and I now encourage you to stay for the questions and answers panel occurring between now and 10:30. Here ends the part two. You have now 30 seconds to review your answers to part two. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. So, tell me about your research project, John. I created a questionnaire for the study to determine people's opinions of the relative feasibility of earning a living in Brisbane. Oh, cool! How is it scored? Are they all multiple choice questions? Well, the questions consist primarily of yes or no responses. There are two free response questions at the end. Participants will use a computer to fill in their answers. That way, it is really easy to analyze the data afterward. Great. It sounds like you have a pretty solid idea of what you should do. Just don't forget to submit a copy of your plans to Professor Curran by the fifteenth. Oh, I, I almost forgot. Hmm. <laughs> You don't do it for the high grade or appraise, but he can review and give you feedback. Right, that will be helpful. He has been conducting studies like this for thirty years now. Yep. Oh, and I'm curious. Are you going to be in the room giving subjects directions for the questionnaire? Well, I think the instructions will be provided by another representative. Who will not be analysing the data? I want them to feel they can answer and be completely anonymous. So I will not be in the room. Anonymity is really important for this study. I agree. Good idea. You should tell the representative to remind subjects to fully consider both sides of each issue. Sometimes 
It's really easy to immediately check yes or no, without stopping to think about it completely. That's so true. It's like a race to finish the questionnaire first or something. I'll make sure to include that in the instructions. This report has to be perfect. Wow, what's the big deal? I know it's part of your grades and all. Well, it's that, but also a well-executed study could grab the attention of faculty in the department, which would be a huge deal. So, for attention? No, silly. I mean, I could really gain the respect of professors who may later take me on as a graduate student in their labs. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Let me take a look at the survey. Wow, this looks great! The map of the median income by region is a great tool. Where did you find it? Oh,、well, thanks. I read a lot of sources and just noticed this one in a small psychology journal called Modern Psychology. It's more helpful than the photo I added, but I think the photo is just so interesting. It was in the newspaper last year during that huge wage strike. It's great. Probably not necessary, but it looks great. I don't understand. What is WKRX's involvement here? Oh, the radio station agreed to sponsor the study if I play their station in the room. Wow, interesting. So you don't have to pay for any of this. Exactly. Nice. Where did you get that idea? Last month. At the psychology club council meeting, someone talked about how easy it is to get sponsorship from local businesses. So I listened to their advice and called around. I'll have to remember that. Well, this all looks great. Good luck. Here ends the part three. You have now thirty seconds to review your answers to part three. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, and welcome to yet another lecture in environmental science. I don't think I'm telling you a secret when I mention that water is a big worry here in Australia. The stuff is scarce. Perhaps that's why we drink so much beer, eh? Seriously, though, a safe and reliable source of water is one of the great concerns of people everywhere. Moreover. As the world population grows, the pressure on existing water supplies grows greater and greater. Think about it. 
our economic system demands that there be more and more consumers. The growing number of people has been tied to climate change, including droughts. So more people means less water. But our economic system demands a high birth rate. Forget about oil. Soon enough, you will see wars for water. Mark my words. But today, I'm going to confine my remarks to Australia. As noted already, here down under, the water supply is extremely scarce. The only drier continent is Antarctica, and remember, no one really lives there anyway. Moreover, in recent years, the wind patterns have changed. Rain that used to fall on the country now falls out to sea, hundreds of miles to the south. Now, when I speak of people needing water, most of you probably think of drinking. Certainly, everyone needs water for drinking, but surprising as it may sound, drinking is not anywhere near being the main use for water. Most water is actually used for washing. When you take a shower, you probably use well over a hundred liters of water. Every time you flush your toilet, that's about eight liters. But most people drink no more than two liters or so per day. So, where to get water? It could be obtained from rainwater, but often rainfall consists of other harmful pollutants that evaporated with the water. In fact. Acid rain, an intense example of this, causes harmful effects on the wildlife of the habitat on which it falls. Water from underground could also be used, though it is more difficult to contain and often must go through an extensive cleansing process. The purest water is found in rivers, creeks, lakes, and dams. And sad to say, Australia has precious few of these. Really, how many of your hometowns have rivers? Year-round rivers, I mean. The soil tends to be sandy, so water soaks into the ground. Many places are rocky too, so 87% of the rainfall is lost to evaporation. That's almost twice the evaporation rate in my native Canada. Speaking of rain, we already heard how rainfall is diminishing here in Oceania. The quantity itself isn't the only problem either. Going back to the problems with obtaining rainwater. A further problem is that rain is a useful source of water only if air pollution is fairly mild. Again, you're in a situation where you can't win. You need water where most people live. People tend to build cities where rainfall is adequate, but then modern cities tend to feature polluted air, which renders the rain far less easily usable. Okay, let's take a look at the table here. You'll see it showing the relative pollution of rainfall in the world's cities. The more people, the dirtier the rain. This is becoming a huge concern for people in the West who want their water to be pure and safe. Though reliable drinking water is important everywhere, the concern in the West is reflected in all the government regulations and political campaigns aimed at solving this problem. In contrast, there are not as many demands made on the governments in Asian and African cultures to improve the water, as their focus is on other issues. Now, whatever the source of water. We can never afford to forget that all water is highly vulnerable to contamination. Whether we're getting it from the ground, from bodies of water, or rainfall, it is susceptible to a variety of toxins. In fact, that's why we clean it before using it. Water carries with it filth and dirt. This problem shows up in a number of different ways. As humans and all other animals need water to survive. It's no surprise to us that one of the most important domestic uses of water is for drinking. Yet, if you have old-fashioned lead pipes, you may slowly be poisoning yourself by drinking that nice, clear water. The industrial pollution, farm chemicals, and leaky landfills are well-known sources of contaminants as well. So, what is being done to ensure we Australians a safe and steady supply of drinking water? There are a lot of initiatives that make admirable efforts to remedy this issue. We'll be talking about this when we meet again on Thursday. But as a preview, I can tell you that so far the amount of real solutions that have been produced is not nearly adequate. Traditionally, we've been very free in this country. That means that every person in every province tend to go its own way. So the mechanisms for water management are, in a word, insufficient. To begin seeing how this is so, I want you to read something before our next class. Though a lot of previous data on water usage and water management are inconclusive and have thus caused quite a concern, 
we can learn a lot from the contents of reports written on the subject. The basis for the government's water policy is the 1989 White Paper reporting on water use, present and future. If you compare the numbers offered in the paper with those in the text, you'll find that the report is rather untrustworthy. Truth being told, I'm being too kind when I say that. The listening module of the test is over, and you now should write your responses to the answer sheet in 10 minutes.